Kali Ghana from Dakali Trading. Welcome to the Love and Other Delusions podcast. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Lady, it is, uh, this is for me personally, a very highly anticipated conversation. I've been, <laughs> since I've moved back to Australia, it's like the world's gone even more fucking crazy than it was in 2020. <laughs> yes, no? Uh, I would say yes. I didn't think it was possible, but somehow every day surprises me. I mean, at this point, I think I'm just numb. So I don't know. I can, I can absolutely relate to that. Why don't you tell everyone what you do so that we can uh, get the okay, conversation so, headed in the direction that we want to deep dive into. Okay. So I am a commodity broker. I'm a futures and options broker, which means uh, we provide a service to clients. We provide them access to the futures markets so they can trade futures, options, um, of any type. That means crude oil, gold, silver, stock indices, treasuries, currencies. We have clients that trade anything you could imagine they trade, even Bitcoin. Uh, some of them, you know, it's been a really, really, really extremely wild year, volatility all over the place. So there's a lot of money to be made and lost on both sides of the coin. So some days are really fun. Some days are absolute torture. So I want to I want to translate that for some people who may not understand what futures markets are and um, commodities are and things like that. I've I'm dangerous now because I know a tiny uh -oh. little bit compared to, <laughs> compared to the last time we had a conversation. Right. <laughs> but I'm I'm uh, I'm wise enough to know that stupid people like me with a tiny little bit of knowledge <laughs> shouldn't shouldn't be the per person that's uh, uh, trying to make sense of yeah. a lot of stuff. So a futures market for anyone who doesn't understand is I'm going to have a go at this and you're going to tell me if sure. I'm right. Okay. So futures market is when you uh, buy at a particular price, expecting that it's going to do something in mm -hmm. at some time in the future, you're a speculator in the market, correct? That That's close that sums it up yeah i mean the idea is you're buying or selling contracts that represent delivery of a commodity so if it's coffee or crude oil or natural gas or whatever it is if you think coffee is going higher you buy a futures contract today and hopefully you can sell it at a higher price down the road sometimes it doesn't work that way sometimes you end up selling at a lower price and that's obviously no fun right and you're not actually going to take ownership of the contract that you're going no. to buy or sell Right. So I've been a broker since 2004 and I can name, uh, I mean, maybe one hand of people that have actually attempted to take delivery or taken delivery. Almost everybody just offsets their obligation on the futures exchange. They're not looking to, they don't want the coffee or the corn or whatever it is they're trading. They just want to speculate on the price. Right. So they're a kind of a player in a market. That's a real market. Right. Like these are sure. real exchanges. And these sure. are people who are looking to insert themselves into those markets. Right. So it, the, it, the important thing to note is if they wanted to take delivery, they could, except for something like crude oil, because let's face <laughs> it, not everybody should. Right now. <laughs> well, well, true. But and not everybody should be able to have crude oil. It could be a dangerous substance. So there's rules against that. But like, for example, anyone that wanted and had the money to do so could take delivery of corn or wheat, you know, a, a non-lethal commodity. And that's important because that's why the futures markets work. That's why the prices uh, are efficient, or at least in, t in the long run are efficient, because they know if they held it all the way to expiration, they would actually have that, right. those 5,000 bushels of corn at the end. And I guess it's important to, to point out that the role that these speculators play have very mm -hmm. real consequences for sure. the actual producers and the participants of the actual supply chain intended or unintended correct and some positive or negative right. it goes both ways sometimes right. speculators drive the price up and that helps farmers or ranchers and sometimes they drive it down and that does the opposite in the long run it really comes down to supply demand fundamentals so yeah. in the in the long run speculators are not really playing a role but in the short run they can for sure why do why do you say that in the long run they don't play much of well, a role? Well, okay, because let's say for example, crude oil in yep. 
May of 2020 when it sold off and went sharply lower. A lot of that was speculation and a lot of that was rookie speculation. Like people that now have access to the markets that didn't used to have access, for example, um, I'm not going to name any brokerage names, but some of the bigger houses mm -hmm. started allowing their stock uh, investors to trade futures. And a lot of those online traders really, uh, they know what crude oil is, but they've, they don't understand the mechanics of the futures and delivery and all those sorts of things. So you get all these rookies in there buying and selling and un not understanding the consequences of uh, the, the crude oil fiasco. There's all kinds of things going on there, but when prices went negative, that was simply because we were going into delivery on the front month contract and people were trying to trade it beyond first on first notice day or beyond. I mean, it was really just a contract that shouldn't have been traded by speculators, but people that didn't know better didn't know better. And so they were trading it. The, the liquidity was light and it allowed the price to move around right. more than it normally would. So, so it sounds like a timing, a perfect storm kind of thing. It was, it was absolutely a perfect storm. It was total <laughs> insanity. But the, the thing is, like, if you notice, crude oil dropped for three or four days and it just washed everyone out, ruined a few people's lives, probably a lot of people's lives. Mm -hmm. Literally a week later, it was back above 20, like nothing happened. So that's what I'm saying. In the short run, the speculators absolutely did put un like unnecessary pressure on the fr front month crude oil contract. But a week later, uh, crude just bounced right back up. And honestly, it actually bottomed out around that time and has been going up ever since really, except for mm. um, up until about a week ago. So well, thank you, Suez Canal. Yeah, right. <laughs> yes. So hard to keep up with these things these days. Yeah. And then wasn't there weird shit that went down with uh, gold as well? And yeah, silver? not as weird, but so gold and silver, I mean, that uh, those those two metals are considered safe haven metals. The idea is when stuff hits the fan, people want to put their money in something that they think has uh, intrinsic value that that's anyway, I'm not saying they're right, but the conventional wisdom is right. times of economic turmoil. You want your money in gold because you know, there's all kinds of thinking. My thinking is you can have as much gold as you want, but that's not going to, if like, if we really have an economic collapse, nobody's going to trade your gold for food or, you know what I mean? It's really not yeah. that valuable, but that's right. a whole nother conversation. People believe that they should have money in gold and silver just in case something crazy happens. So of course, in March, 2020, when we all know something what happened, crazy happened. Just, <laughs> yeah, something <laughs> the motherfucker more of all motherfucker yes. crazy things. I mean, happened. <laughs> something that no one ever in a million years would have possibly imagined <laughs> happened. And so of course, Everybody, actually the weird, the first initial reaction on gold and silver was to crash. It crashed with the stock market. Like everybody wow. went, went to cash. So people sold gold, silver, copper, um, crude oil, their stocks, their treasuries, everything crashed for about a day or two. And then, well, stocks crashed for more than that. But anyway, gold and silver crashed for a few days because everybody was liquidating going to cash because they didn't know what to do. This is an unprecedented situation. But then eventually they realized, wait a minute, I want to have my money in gold and silver because that's supposedly the safe haven. And honestly, it was just a ridiculously wild ride from lows to highs. Um, and it hasn't stopped ever since it, with a whole bunch actually, of different shit. <laughs> the, the chaos just, it's honestly like it started in the stock. Well, it actually, it started with crude oil. Then uh -huh. it went to the stock market. Then it went to treasuries. Then it went to crude that it went to metals and it literally just, just when we think we've cleaned up one mess, there's something else going on over here. So I think about you regularly. I worry about you. I'm, it's regularly exhausting. If I'm, if I'm honest, I, I worry I, about myself. <laughs> I need to check in with you more because I'm thinking about you a lot. Whenever I see this stuff, I'm like, I'm wondering if Carly's okay because <laughs> the stress in all of the things that you've it's, got to manage with. Yeah. Particularly the, like the the stress up and down it's like you never really get to get some sort of equilibrium it's, in your world yeah it's just right and most people don't understand like we're we're brokerage so on the brokerage side of things there's a lot of risk um beyond market risk so like our clients are buying and selling commodities mm -hmm. but they're doing so on leverage which means they can lose more than they have in their trading accounts which can you, can in you, normal can you explain that a little bit more 
Uh huh. Sure. So it's kind of like when you, when you buy a house, right? You put 10% down or 20% down. Let's just say you buy a house. That's, I don't know, whatever, 200,000. Okay. It's a very, it's a, it's a low cost city. It's 200,000. So you, you buy a house for 200,000, but you only put $20,000 down. Okay. Uh But you put 20,000 down, but the house price is fluctuating. The entire 200,000 is like if house prices in that area go up 10%, you gain 10% on that entire 200,000. Yeah. If it goes down, you lose on the, the 200,000. So meanwhile, your principal, your $20,000 might double or might get wiped out. You know what I mean? Oh, so yeah. that's what leverage is. It's the same thing as when you buy okay. a house. You're right. basically buying your house on leverage because you're using debt or credit. So in the futures markets, everybody's, almost everybody, I shouldn't say everybody, but most people are trading on credit, meaning that they're using leverage. leverage. So if they're trading let's say crude oil at $50 a barrel, that one contract represents $50,000 worth of crude oil. The margin on that might only be 5,000. So they're only putting a small amount of money in their account to trade a $50,000 crude oil future. And what happens is if they're right, maybe they double their account, they triple their account, so on. If they're wrong, they can easily wipe out their 5,000 and then uh, get into the brokerage firm's pockets. And that happened a lot last year, unfortunately. So, so for us on the brokerage end, it was extremely stressful. We had a lot of sleepless nights. Um, mm-hmm. Some clients, unfortunately, did lose a lot more than they had in their account almost immediately. That's the sad thing. Wow. Most of our clients are responsible. We give them all the tools they need to manage their risk. And even, but in extreme situations, sometimes it's just it happens so quick, they can't react and we can't react. And then it gets to the point where they've lost they owe us money. And sometimes, um, depending on their situation, they may or may not be able to pay that money. So as a brokerage firm, we're just standing here, uh, you know, holding all the, holding the bag if something goes wrong. It's very Vegas of you. It is. That's <laughs> exactly. I know ever. it's so ironic that I that you live, live and work in Las Vegas because it's literally kind of what I, it's like it's the gambling. casino off the strip. Yes. <laughs> It's, it's, uh, right. I, I'm somebody who's a little risk of us. I'm, I'm the calculated risk kind of person. That's good for you. Well, it, I just know that I can't have nice things because of that reason, you know, <laughs> you know, and everybody has I a different can't go into your world. Yeah. Well, yeah. And it's like, you've got to have a great risk appetite if you want to play with the people that play in your world. Yeah. Um, a lot of them are getting bitten right now. Mm-hmm. But a lot of people are not it's, getting bitten. Yeah. You know what's the wildest thing about this whole 2020, <laughs> 2021? It's the weirdest thing. So <laughs> the people that have been around and been doing this for a while, and you, you know, I've known them to know what they're doing and to be relatively good at navigating mm-hmm. the markets, those are the people that are having a hard time. It's the, the newbies that literally barely know what a call option is or making money. It's because they're the markets are behaving so unusually that things that shouldn't work, work. And the things that normally do work are just not working. So oh. uh, it has been really messy. You know, uh, I, I'm somebody who, like, my superpowers that I read people well in the sense that like I can watch somebody talking and know whether I believe them or not, like whether they're talking out of their ass or not. And so (laughs) that's an Australianism right there for you. You can borrow that if you want. Okay. (laughs) I will remember that. And I, I've been trying to figure out like what's causing the, like it seems unprecedented what's happening in your world. Sure. It's, so go ahead. No, I no, keep going. It's absolutely unprecedented. So there are a lot of people who give opinions about what's about to happen mm-hmm. in, in right. your world, right? So sure. because I know I'm not somebody who can actually buy and sell stocks uh, <laughs> because it gives me, like, I'll have an ulcer in a week. I like to <laughs> try and figure out like, who knows what they're talking about now? So this is a very interesting thing that you just brought up. So there's a few things that I I tell people. The ultimate, the reality is 
nobody knows what the future brings. Nobody knows what any market's going to do. How the thing is markets are, there are some people in this business that want to believe that what they learned in their finance class is how the world works. Like there's equations and they can pump some numbers in and this is what's going to happen. No, (laughs) that doesn't happen because people are like the markets are moving and people are buying and selling based on emotion and sentiment. They're humans. Yes. Their human reaction has nothing to do with what something is actually worth. I mean, I'm, I'm not in the stock business, so I, you know, I'm not an expert on stocks, but I look at things like Tesla shares, like the market cap being Mm -hmm. bigger than all other car companies in the world combined. That just doesn't make any sense. Even if you're looking into the future, you'd have to look into the future 20 years to see something. I mean, it just makes no sense, but that it doesn't matter. The market moves anyway. It is what it is. So, I mean, the, the reality is if just because somebody's on TV or they write in a magazine, or that doesn't mean they know what's going to happen. Yes. Okay. They don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I mean, especially when you get in a situation like this, where there's so much rampant speculation because the markets are volatile and things are moving and it's just kind of the hot, like the trendy thing to be a trader. You start going on Twitter. It seems like everybody's making money and everybody yeah. acts like they know what they're talking about. Trust me. First of all, if they are making money, it's not going to last because anybody that that knows how to make money in the market's not on Twitter bragging about it. That's just not how it works. <laughs> the people, you know what I mean? The people on Twitter bragging about it are probably, they might be doing really well because the market's behaving abnormally, <laughs> but their account will probably just go quiet one day and you'll know why. So <laughs> when they stop bragging on Twitter, you know, they're right. back to, yes. to, to buying off brand products again. <laughs> exactly. Right. I mean, it's really just everybody's guessing and some people are going to guess better than others. Um, if you, I would urge anybody, if you do decide to get into the markets and I'm not talking about investing, that's different as opposed to trading right. and investing are two different things, but if you're trading, Don't just expect that some guy on YouTube or Twitter said this, and so I'm going to buy this stock. That's not how it works. And if you do that and it works once, you're lucky. If you do it again, you're probably- a beach. Yeah. And yes, actually the worst thing that could ever happen to a beginning trader is to make money. Mm -hmm. I really honestly believe that because people step in, they make a lot of money right off the bat and they just assume it's easy and they don't respect the markets or the risk and it never ends well. So- and why I was saying that is because um, I noticed what you were saying, that the people who are actually experienced at doing this seem to be the ones that are complaining. They don't know what the fuck's going on. <laughs> and right? right. And so yeah. I, I noticed that there were a lot of kids, actually. And, Young, yes. And weirdly enough, a lot of QAnon followers were mm-hmm. having their first ch- time go at stocks and and doing well <laughs> yeah. in in, uh, in rabbit's ears. And so I started to just go and have a look at like what the two different groups of people, how they were talking about stocks and mm-hmm. what's coming. And, and one thing that I noticed was that in the people who have been doing this for a long time, a couple of different things were emerging. They were either trying to push their agenda Mm-hmm. Or they were simply just saying, <laughs> the crash is coming, the crash is coming, the crash is coming, yeah, the crash is coming. Right. You know, there's there's one of two people on that side of yeah. things. And then on the Q and like the Q and on side of things, the mm-hmm. inexperienced kind of the kids or they were just saying, let's all get into this. Let's do it. Let's right. change the, his- the future history of the market, et cetera, et cetera. And you're like, this could actually change the landscape of the way that things are done yeah temporarily yes right so yeah so it's it's really to me i'm i'm torn i'm not going to bad mouth any of the kids trading and i'm glad they're involved in the markets right i mean i'm it's good that they're getting interested i wish they were more interested on like a lifetime investing saving kind of thing as opposed to just gambling but that requires too much of an attention span like come on now (laughs) So you know it is what it is. Yes, <laughs> I know. I'm just trying to be optimistic here. But the interesting thing is like back in the 80s, 70s, 80s, we did have similar things where, you know, people did pump and dump stocks, but it was different. Mm-hmm. Back then we didn't have the internet. 
So it was like a boiler room full of brokers that would pick up the phone and talk people into buying the same stock at the same time to push stocks up. And then they'd tell their buddies to go in and sell at one. You know, it's pump and dump scheme that's been around forever. Yeah. Now they're doing the same thing, but they're using the internet with Reddit and they can just contact so many more people instantly. And this should, I mean, this sounds completely crazy, but the stimulus checks are kind of adding fuel to the fire because there's all these kids that are like in college, don't have any bills, their parents are paying their way and they have this extra stimulus money and they literally are going onto their Robinhood app and buying Tesla stock or some other call option. And it, it is manipulating the markets. In the long run, this is not gonna last. It will eventually end and it's gonna end poorly. I think it's already started. We, um, actually the reason you contacted me to, to do this mm -hmm. particular episode is about a month ago, we did a webinar and we were trying to let, you know, talking about the next pain trade. The thing about markets is markets are not, there's nothing friendly about markets. They're mean. They, the they savage. literally will, they are, they are there to cause the most amount of pain to the most amount of people. So when everybody's all giddy and happy and excited and making their decisions, not based on risk and reward, but just based on, you know, uh, environmental factors or social justice, or it's just not, it's just not going to last. Yeah. And so, and what they were, what a lot of these kids were doing is not only buying the underlying stock, but they were buying call options, mm -hmm. which What's a call op like, option for okay. people who don't know. So a call option is a financial instrument that's written against a stock or a futures contract. And the idea is instead of buying the stock or futures outright and having all the risk of the price fluctuation, you buy a call option and your risk is limited. You, whatever you pay for that call option is the most you can lose. If you're buying a call, you're betting the price of the stock or future is gonna go up mm -hmm. above the strike price of that call. So if you're buying close to the money strikes, then those calls are gonna be expensive. If you're buying out of the money strikes, they're gonna be cheaper, but you have a, a set number, like your risk is limited. If you're paying- You know what you're I mean, getting. I mean, stock is a little, yeah. Stocks, it's, it's almost, I hesitate to say this because compliance gets mad when I say stuff like this, but it's kind of like a lottery ticket. Mm -hmm. Like you pay your money, you put your money on the table and it either pays off or it doesn't. Well, right. in a market like we've had, you one thing that I should say is, the NASDAQ in like 10 or 11 months from the March lows rallied so much that it basically matched the gains that it did in 10 months. It matched the gains that took 10 years to do in the Holy previous shit. day. So this is my opinion. They literally just um, pulled forward all, all those stockings into that one year period or 10 month period. When in reality, in a normal market, it might've taken a decade to do that. So, so they've accelerated the, that. They've growth. accelerated. Yes. That's my opinion. I mean, some people think that this is just the beginning and we're, I don't think so, but anyway, so you can see how like normally. Wait, when, wait, 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 okay. wait, you, ju okay. you just said something and, and moved on really quickly. Some people think yes. this is just the beginning. Yeah. Well, yeah, but they're, they're probably going to be wrong. I'm not, I don't have a crystal ball, but <laughs> I think they're going to be wrong. <laughs> I think this is way beyond the beginning. I think this is like the end. Are we about to see the apocalypse yeah. of financial I mean, crashes? It, I, would, I wouldn't be shocked to see that. Honestly, though, even if we don't see that, we are probably going to see a decade of sideways market action. That's what we've seen in the past. Even if we don't get a huge crash, which could happen, anything's possible, we should at least just trade sideways and consolidate these because you can't go up at this pace forever. Okay. With that said, because these gains have been so accelerated in such a short amount of time and so swift, just simply buying call options has worked and it's worked magically well, or at least it did up until about a month ago. Suddenly the market didn't, the market really hasn't sold off that much. If you look at the S&P, we're like literally at an all-time high, the NASDAQ slightly off its all-time high. Mm -hmm. It's not like we've seen a big crash or anything, but buying call options has stopped working because the market's haven't sold off, but they've stopped going up. And so suddenly people are starting to realize, oh, we can't just print money in our Robinhood accounts by buying call options. And so it's starting to, starting to they're starting to feel the pain a little bit. Itself. Yeah, but for, so far it's been tame. I think we're due for just a really good shellacking to kind of wipe out the weak hands. Um, 
I hope we see it. I'd love to do that. I would love to see that because I'd be an aggressive buyer, but mm -hmm. we'll see. I mean, I mean, who knows? At, at some people, the, the part that I don't understand and I need your help understanding. Okay. If, if you inject a whole bunch of cash that mm -hmm. was previously not in, in, in that market. So people, right. you know, a lot of people who've never invested before got the Robinhood app or the Acorn app or whatever and decided right. like, all right, I've got... Let me just throw 500 bucks at this. <laughs> right. There are a lot of people that did that, right? At some point, yes. there's going to be something that scares the shit out of these people. They're going to mm -hmm. take that cash out. <laughs> like, isn't that sure. the opposite oh. side of this equation? Yes, correct. Yes, exactly. Now, it'll be interesting because a lot of these people did buy options as opposed to buying the stock, which the options will just expire worthless and they lost what they lost. It's not like they have to actually sell the stock. So they're not going to affect the stock price by with that. Um, but you're right. And the thing about, we should mention about some of the new apps like Robinhood, I hate to call them out, but they're really, really good at making an app. They made it very mm -hmm. user-friendly. The kids loved it. And one thing that they had in there that really um, changed the marketplace is they have like a, like a heat map that shows which stocks are moving the most right. today. And so what, by you know human nature, people that don't know what they're doing, they're not gonna type in a symbol of a stock that nobody's trading. They see the heat map and they're buying the top three on there. So you get all these people with a small amount of money in their account, but they're all buying the same stock at the same time. And Creates a, like a it just becomes chaos. Yeah, it's almost like a video game. They turned it into a video game and that's not what the financial markets are for. So how this ends is going to be really interesting. Is it going to end or is it the new normal? I don't, I, it just can't be the new normal. At some point it has to come to fundamentals. Like at some point you have to say, wait a minute, Tesla is not worth more than every other car company in the world. So it, it may not be today's it might take five years, who knows, but at some point it reality will hit and it, it always does. Will it? Like, I know it always has, yeah. but given the new, well, I mean, eventually I, we're going to run out of money, right? Right. <laughs> right. I mean, so, so I don't know. will they, or will more people well, jump on the game? Uh, uh, honestly, I mean, like I'm not asking you to grab a we, crystal ball or anything. Yeah, sure. Right. Is this something that could be a new direction, given that the barrier to entry seems to have dropped? Sure. I agree with you. The barrier to entry is, is lower. I think once the thing is right now, people were making money, right? So for eight, nine months, it was right. just easy money and everyone made money. Stocks never went down. Like literally, if you look at a chart, the corrections Still were gone. very shallow. Yeah. That's not how markets generally work. And all, all it's going to take is one good correction for people to uh, remember what it's like to, to lose money. And that'll kind of people will start to lose interest when that happens. It always happens. This is very similar to what we saw in like 1998, 2000, right. the exact same thing. Everybody was quitting their jobs and day trading and um, really, yeah, it was That's the same thing, now? same thing. Yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. All over the internet. I see like in these forums and TikTok, which is really, really interesting. That's like a whole nother world. But there's so many people encouraging everybody, hey, quit your job. This is what we do for a living. We buy and sell, you know, yeah, they're and their strategies, as those people. They, uh, I agree with you. It's not a good, I'm not advocating it. It's not good at all. Because they're what they're doing is they're making it seem like it's so easy to mm -hmm. trade. People will ruin their lives. I've heard of people mortgaging their house to buy GameStop and that didn't end well. You know, it's anytime you're trying to get rich quick, it's a really bad idea. Very bad. Can you explain for people, the number of people that contacted me and said, can you talk about GameStop on the podcast? <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Let's just break down the GameStop thing because it's sure. a really great example of everything that we've been talking about, right? It is. It's kind of the, yes, the, the pinnacle example. epitome. Yes, yes, it is exactly. Okay. So GameStop is... I don't know if you're familiar with what GameStop is. It's basically a video game company. You can go in and buy a console or buy a video game, which nobody does anymore, right? They you download them malls. online or... You go in the mall, yeah. there's usually a GameStop shop right yes. near the entrance yes. because the right. kids want to go in and buy, you know, GTO or whatever it yes. is that they're going to... GTA. 
I That's am a good not game, a gamer. By the way. <laughs> okay. Again, I can't have nice yeah. things. That's why I can't play right. games because I've become Got it. the person who plays them for 14 hours a day. It's it's addicting. It is. Oh, addicting. no doubt. Okay. So their business model is obviously in decline because there's new technology and mm-hmm. so on and so forth. They they became a company and a stock that nobody paid attention to. Their stock was worth whatever, $10 or less. I think it got down to five. I mean, I don't follow it that closely, but basically it's just a sleeper of a stock. Nobody cared about it. Nobody. And so, but it was the perfect target for what happened because of that. Nobody's paying attention to it. There were some hedge funds that were short the stock. When you, when you're short a stock, what it means is, um, okay. So any company that has stock issued, they only have a limited number of shares. However many shares that is, you can't just say, well, now there's more. No, it doesn't work like that. There's only, let's just make it super simple. Let's say there's a hundred shares of this company. Mm -hmm. No matter what, no matter who buys and sells what the price goes, there's always going to be a hundred shares. Well, if a trader thinks that that stock is going down, what they do is they borrow shares from their brokerage and then they sell it. And then when they're done selling it and they buy it back, they give the shares back to their brokerage. They pay interest on it. Somehow, somewhere along the line, GameStop, uh, well, hedge funds were able to borrow more shares. I think if I recall correctly, they actually borrowed more shares than are in existence of GameStop. So they were trading. (laughs) Yeah, right. So they were highly, highly, highly levered. And for them, it was an easy trade because nobody's paying attention to the company they thought was worthless, which uh, the trade probably worked for a long time. The stock just slowly dribbled lower, but that's the whole point that these kids on Reddit or adults, I don't know how old they are. We call them kids, but whatever. Inexperienced traders. These, these traders on Reddit decide, and which was actually a very genius move. Mm -hmm. They got wind of the fact that all these hedge funds, or at least one or two big hedge funds were short the stock. And they knew exactly how to game the system. So they started buying deep out of the money call options, which what that buying call options itself increases the value of the call options because the demand goes up. So people don't understand that it also can suck the price of the stock up. And it does that because there, if you're buying a call option, somebody has to sell it to you. That's either a market maker or another hedge fund or another trader. The people that are selling those calls will want to hedge their price risk. So if let's say that they sell a bunch of calls above the market and suddenly the stock starts going up, they either need to, they're either going to panic and buy their calls back at a loss, or they could buy shares of stock to hedge it and sleep well at night. Well, it just became a wild, like uncontrollable snowball because so many people bought so many call options all at the same time, as well as buying the stock. And it forced prices up so quickly that uh, blew out a few really big hedge funds, ruined some lives, made some kids rich. I mean, kind of the perfect storm of chaos in that one arena. So, and did it, it was like a, an industry that had a certain flow about it and a certain kind mm-hmm. of ease with a normal type of chaos was blown out of the water by the new tsunami of chaos that came from people who you would hear headlines of like people had these kids have no right um (laughs) you know coming into our industry they're being irresponsible etc etc and one might say given what happened 10 years ago right you know the irony of that kind of a a statement out of Mm -hmm. people who were bailed out from the wizardry mm-hmm. and fuckery that they'd created sure. with, with uh, you know, all of yeah. the mess of 2008. It was the pop calling the kettle black. Mm-hmm. I, look, I'm not, I'm not on either side. I can see, yeah, no, I think no. everybody is wrong. Mind. They're everybody's, um, the thing is, these people were buying GameStop stock and calls, not because they liked the company or, you know, for no other, it was literally a video game and they mastered it and they, you know, they beat Super right. Mario Brothers. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. I mean, and I don't, the thing is, what's interesting is they, they caught the hedge fund sleeping. I mean, if the, yeah. from the hedge fund, fund perspective, they should have never had that much open into risk, but 
in their defense, nothing like that's ever happened before. And it happened so fast, like, how could they have known? So, I mean, I get it. And I actually, I believe it or not, I do feel sorry for them because that's something that um, they probably literally on paper, like on their mathematical equations, which is what they want to believe the world is. They it yeah, right. was literally <laughs> no risk. And then suddenly they're like, they lost their house. That's kind of sad. you forgot but, the little kids in the, in the game. You didn't yeah. include that in you. <laughs> Right. So, but I don't feel sorry for them. I mean, they're the professionals. They should have known better than to, to be, let it go that far. That said, I actually feel really horrible for all the kids on games. Like we want to talk about how much money they made, but I can guarantee you most of them gave it all back or, and a lot of people got in late because they start seeing it on TV and in the yeah. papers and they got excited and they bought near the highs and lost a ton, like, like life-changing money for these people. So in the end, when it's all said and done, I can guarantee you more people lost money on that than made money. Because it requires- At least on the retail side. Right, because it requires people to pull money out in order for them to act, because other than that, yes. it's just numbers on a, on a screen. Correct, it's, yeah, you're, yeah, right. Your screen can say you have a million dollars, but unless you actually sell it and take that money right. out, it's just, it's like monopoly money. And of course, why would they sell it? They just turned 20 grand into a boatload of money and everybody on the internet saying yeah, diamond hands. <laughs> yeah, right. So, <laughs> and they don't know what they're doing. They don't, they're totally underestimating the risk. So they're running uh, off adrenaline. Yeah. It's the first time they've experienced something like yeah, this. Right. And while they're trying to, I mean, the funny thing to watch was uh, people continuing to say, oh, what's the term? Um, diamond hands. No, no, the term oh. of people who who sell something when they want everyone to keep up, it's a Bitcoin term when they um they don't <laughs> want people to sell their Bitcoin because if too many people sell it drives the right. the price down. I can, I I'm too old for that gonna, stuff. <laughs> well, funnily enough, Bitcoin is something that I'm very interested in. Well, Are crypto you? in okay. general. I'm I'm I I think that the world is in a massive kind of moment of evolution into a different direction. Yeah. I don't know where that's going. I just think that people are fed up and destroying buildings and, you know, rioting and doing all of that thing isn't going to get them what they want. No, for sure not. So I think people are looking for alternatives of how to prepare for what's coming and they're looking for interesting or different ways that they may be able to adapt to what's coming. And I think that a lot of landscapes, political, mm -hmm. economical, uh, financial, uh, government on all different levels, uh, personal relationships, everything, I think the landscape's changing in this moment that we're shifting in. And I think that's that's why I'm really interested yeah. to, to understand from you, your perspective on, is this something that is a moment in time or is this us witnessing a new landscape in commodities and stock trading? Right. Uh, I'm leaning towards a moment in time. The one thing that I've learned throughout my time in the industry is humans never change. The same cycles occur over and over and over again. Now I can't say Bitcoin's a whole different animal. Mm -hmm. uh, cryptocurrencies are a whole different animal because the idea is uh, decentralization and some sort right. of alternative. So that's a whole different thing. But I, right. as far as the speculation goes, yep. um, it, the same things happen over and over again, and it's not going to end well. That's my advice. That's my inclination. That doesn't mean it's going to end tomorrow. It, these things can go on for a long time, longer than any of us uh, can imagine. The interesting thing about Bitcoin to me is um, everybody talks about it, but very few people are actually trading it. Right. So, and the last I checked, it's been a little while, but literally like 90 something percent of the Bitcoin is held by in the world is held by like a few people. So it's not like everyone talks about it, but nobody literally owns it. Or if people do, it's a real a small sliver. Mm -hmm. And the Bitcoin or in even cryptocurrency uh, brokerage 
side of things is a really dangerous, it's really dangerous. So we offer, our brokerage offers Bitcoin futures, which are traded on an exchange. In that situation, each transaction is guaranteed. So you don't have to worry about if you buy Bitcoin and it goes up, you don't have to worry about the person that sold it to you not being able to pay because the exchange is guaranteeing the transaction. But if you're trading cryptos on one of these little uh, offshoot brokers, they're off, they're called off exchange. They're not really regulated. It's kind of the wild west. Nobody's watching them. They can literally just close up shop and take your money. I'm not saying they are, I'm saying they can, and it happens. So you have to be really careful with that sort of stuff. It's, I think it's a really good idea. And I think eventually it's going to get to something that maybe changes things, but I don't think we're quite there yet. So Anybody that's listening, if you are going to play with those sorts of things, make sure it's risk capital because even if you're, you buy Bitcoin and it keeps going up and your account says you have all this money, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to actually be able to get that money from the right. brokerage. So just be careful. That's all I'm and saying. To, to qualify risk capital is money that you can burn. It's yes. Money like if, payment. <laughs> yes. If you lose it, it, you're going to be a little sad, but it's not going to ruin your life. That's right. really what it is. Yeah. And that's the dangerous part in all of this, right? Like people yes. are looking to change their lives to risk proof themselves from right. the next thing that's going to show up like the pandemic, because now right. we're all in apocalypse mode <laughs> and we've right. been there for far too long and thing <laughs> up, it was Trump and then the pandemic and then you know, the race riots and, and, and more and more and more, it's like always, everything's, yeah. it's like, I, I cannot tell you how different life is in Australia. Really? I feel it's... like I'm living in 2019. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It seems like a nice place to be. I miss 2019. You, gotta come visit. you really got to come I should. visit. Open invitation yeah. for when the borders back up, you've got to come right. visit me. But it's just I'll do that. really bizarre. There's yeah, no, that is like, really bizarre. Um, like everything's open. You don't even have to wear masks on public transport. People in supermarkets wow. don't wear masks. Um, there <sighs> is no like doom and gloom. Hmm. There's no guns. It's <laughs> I don't have to worry about mass shootings. Like yeah. all of that weirdness being back here. I'm like, I have no idea where I am. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's sad and I can't speak to your experience, obviously, but um, I mean, our society is being held up, held hostage by it with politics on both yeah. sides yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, they're both pull, both sides are pulling really, really hard and nobody's winning. Everybody's losing. So I don't know. And it's, people are buying uh, into it with their identity politics. Oh, that's yeah. And people like marry a side and then they yeah. can't listen to anyone else yeah. oh it's yeah it's bad it's bad i keep hoping that this is just a phase but it just we seem to be getting deeper and deeper so i don't know girl i don't know if this is a phase i'm really <laughs> that, that's why i'm i'm wondering if we've changed society and culture long term because a lot of these yeah. different elements seem to be shifting people seem to understand that there's a new barrier to entry to creating wealth and that, that's a facade people seem to be hmm. believing that um that their opinions and their identity politics matter and that's a facade people seem right. to think that the government is here to help us that's a facade uh, absolutely right and so i'm i'm oh. kind of concerned that people are buying into the bullshit without looking at the backstory and right. and you know critical thinking around some of these really important directions that the world is going right. in. But too many people, like the mob, is driving all of these different. Sure. Um, you said something very interesting that I never really thought about before when it comes to like all the mass speculation that we're seeing in stocks and commodities is. You know, there is so much hype about the um, the income equality, inequality differences. And you're right, maybe some people are motivated uh, by that, which is really even worse. That makes me feel even worse because I'm they're sorry. literally shooting themselves <laughs> in the foot. That's really it's sad dangerous. to think about it's that. It's really, really oh, dangerous. Oh, very right? dangerous. 
Yeah. The only way, the only way to build wealth is the slow and boring way. I mean, I know for a living, I, we basically gamble for a living. So coming from me, um, that says a lot. There is no get rich quick scheme. Even if you're a great trader, um, you're, nobody's going to get rich overnight. And if they do, they better keep them, like take the money out and just call it quits. It's just like when you're at Vegas and you win some money on the table, walk away. If you don't, you're going to give it back. That's literally, that's just how life is. And, so it's and, really sad to see. And you've lost your yeah. shirt a couple of times. Like, oh, for, absolutely. All of this. Like you, you spoke sure. about that on my other podcast a couple of years mm -hmm. ago. Like it's one of those things that there's a weird natural balance. Yeah. That just has a play in this, right? Uh, uh, yes, absolutely. And yeah, you definitely bring a different, um, different perspective to that. And even like, even if we're not talking about trading in general, just on the brokerage side of things, this, this behavior that some of these traders are, um, partaking in is can, and is dangerous. Like for example, my, I, I don't know if I have spoken to you about my experience during the crude oil fiasco. In, no, we, in 2020, we a little bit over Insta about it. I right. was really so, worried about you then. <laughs> so it was actually literally, I mean, it was a complete nightmare. So I was oh, in New York for a trader's show, which I do all the time. We were supposed and, to catch up in New York yes, at that time. Yes. Remember yep, that was right. I, yeah. It was like our first week of March. Yeah. So I was in New York. Um, which means I work when I, I travel all the time, but I always work. I have my laptop with me. The markets are open, like normal market hours. I'm working normally not a huge deal, but in this particular instance, crude oil started to crash and I was like in a hotel in uh, Brooklyn, like trying to liquidate clients because people were just immediately like from when the market closed on Friday, we had no margin calls, but when the mar market reopened on Sunday night, because futures open and trade 24 hours, they open Sunday night. Mm -hmm. When the market reopened, suddenly clients that didn't have margin calls on Friday actually not only had lost all the money in their account, but lost more. So they were, as we mentioned before, when people trade on leverage, they can lose more than they have in their wow. account. So I literally spent about 72 hours straight sitting in front of my laptop in a hotel, liquidating positions to try to get everybody flat, no eating, no sleeping, no, like I was just a wow. complete nightmare. And after it was said and done, I owed the brokerage firms money. I had to wire funds to just to kind of keep our, our business afloat. Um, honestly, it was, we were, it was really ugly. So take that situation. And if you remember during the GameStop fiasco, um, Robin Hood, kind of ran into basically the exact same situation. Yeah. I felt really bad for them, but on a much bigger scale, because they're dealing with much bigger money than I'm dealing with. So they ran into the same situation. They're, they're traders, even if they're, most of their clients are just buying stock or buying call options, which has limited risk and is not on leverage. They were allowing some of their clients to trade on leverage. And then the people on the other side of those trades were hedge funds. They were trading on leverage by selling the call options to these retail call buyers. And they were losing more money than they had on, in their accounts. And so that almost wiped out Robinhood, to be honest. I don't know if any, most people know that, but they had to get liquidity injections over the weekend and they, they survived and I'm glad they did. But these sorts of things can wipe out brokerage firms, which if they wipe out us, it's probably not gonna change the world. But if you start wiping out some of the bigger shops, it's really going to have a, a rippling effect in the financial industry. So, um, while it hasn't gotten to that yet, you know, there's this kind of crazy speculation could really throw things off balance. And to, to qualify what you've, not to qualify what you've just said, to help people understand mm -hmm. what you've just said a little better, um, okay. help me, correct me if I'm wrong, what you're saying is that whatever your clients are mm -hmm. betting <laughs> right. on all of this, you have to hold that cash position. You have right. to have so we, that in, in, you have to have that available, right? Even right. if they're uh, working on leverage. Well, no, not necessarily. So we don't, but we like, it's, it gets pretty complicated, but okay. um, we don't hold our clients money. We use a clearing firm to do that. Right. So the clearing firm has to have the government requires or the fed requires that they have X number of dollars to basically cushion any of that risk. So they have to have that money on, 
on deposit. Right. We, we don't. However, when our clients start getting into trouble, that's when we, they start, first of all, they take all our commissions and stop paying us commissions until, right. <laughs> until everything settles down. Right. But then they, they also require in extreme situations like this, we actually had to wire funds to uh, our partners who then wired funds to the clearing firm to hold, make sure we, everybody right. could hold positions and all that sort of thing. Because in, in futures, the exchange guarantees every transaction, but it's not because the exchange is uh, generous. They're using everybody below them, all their money to guarantee those transactions. So if my client defaults, I pay the exchange, you know, I pay the clearing firm, the clearing it, firm pays the exchange. The exchange doesn't have any risk. It's all us. So it sounds like a house of cards. <laughs> it's well, there are a lot of safeguards to prevent things from like, honestly, I trust the, the futures market mechanisms more than I do the stocks sense. because there's, um, there's just more in futures. There's the regulations are a lot tighter. There's a lot right. more uh, eyes on things and we deal with leverage every day for a living. This is what we do. Mm -hmm. Everybody along the chain is used to it. But when you start getting into the stock brokerage world, like for example, Robinhood, they're the, the uh, founders of Robinhood are probably really great developers, but they probably didn't fully understand the brokerage side of things and the mm -hmm. consequences of letting rookies trade with leverage and that sort of thing. So I think that they probably learned a lot of good lessons. Um, and almost went broke in the process. Almost, but we've all been there. So it's just <laughs> part of the business. Unfortunately, it, it happens. Do you think that this is, I mean, I can't get off this, this question for me in 2021 so far is, are we creating a new normal? Are we, are people looking for the majority, the, the majority of people are not in a situation where they have a lovely home and that they can afford. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they are not certain about their future. They are looking for a way out of all of that uncertainty and they have time to burn right now because they're sitting sure. there. And so they're spending time learning about things that they didn't know about before as the mechanism right. for getting into something new because, you know, I've heard a lot of people say, and in a lot of my coaching, uh, I've got a lot of people coming from corporate wanting mm -hmm. to get into small business my entrepreneurship mastermind group sold out because people no longer wow. want to be dependent on corporate. They sure. no longer want to be dependent on a job. And they Can't want to them. figure out, yeah. How, yeah, right. Like you and I as small business owners, we, sure. we are, are there. Like that's why we do it. what we do. <laughs> and people are starting to see your world because of the lowering of the barrier to entry. Mm -hmm. Do we start to see from here um, more Robin Hood apps popping up, more people turning their hand at all of this and saying, well, I'm going to start trading commodities because why not? Right. I like um, coffee. Sure. Of course. You know, I think a lot of that, that is happening. And I think a, a lot of it is, um, you know, whilst a small sector of the economy was hit really hard. So like food and beverage entertainment was hit really, really hard. The majority of the economy just kept going as usual. Most, you know what I mean? So there's really a big discrepancy there, but I do think um, certain part of the economy had a lot of extra money because they weren't spending money on other things. They weren't traveling and right. it made its way into speculation. I know it, our brokerage has been very busy and I know a lot of it, I don't know, no, but I suspect a lot of it is just that people have a little extra money. They're willing to try different things. Like you mentioned, they've been home, they're learning. So I think all of those things are absolutely happening. I don't know if they're permanent. I've been around, I, some of it is, a lot of it's not. I, I've been around uh, commodity cycles over and over again, and it's the same. It's, this is a very boom and bust industry. When people think that when markets are moving and people think there's easy money, we get really busy. When things are really quiet, like in 2019, the markets were really quiet. Commodities traded sideways uh, and they were really low in price and they traded sideways. You remember coffee just kept dribbling lower and lower and everyone's like, what? It, so nobody wanted to trade commodities then. Now everybody wants to trade, but 
it's feast or famine. The thing about commodities is the cure to high prices is high prices. Everyone's going to ramp up production. Prices will come back down. It'll get boring again. People will lose interest. Same with stocks. It's the same idea. We're already seeing a lot of that in the, in the tech stocks and NASDAQ. They've calmed down quite a bit. They're not, um, they're not as volatile. And people will just get bored with it. They'll start losing money. I mean, it's just like, again, if you go to Vegas and you put 50 bucks in the slot machine and it takes it and doesn't give you any play, that's no fun, right? So you mm -hmm. walk away, you might not gamble again the whole trip. But if you put 50 bucks in and it lets you play for a little while, it's fun and you keep doing it. Well, eventually it's, the markets aren't going to be fun anymore. They don't do this forever. They calm down, things quiet down, it gets boring. People yeah, do other people, things. People so. are drunk off the social media attention. Right? <laughs> yes, yes. That, that's like you were saying, like human behavior is such a huge influencer in a lot of this kind of mm -hmm. stuff. And that little love button that little love dispenser, Correct. which is yeah. the like button, you know, on Instagram yeah. and whatnot, or the, the upranking on Reddit, that's driving people's behavior around and the mob mentality. What role mm -hmm. do you think, like I, I was trying to understand, um, I saw this video where Trent Denny was saying that if, if the apocalypse doesn't happen, I'll quit my job this time. <laughs> and what do you think the or do you think that this impending kind of there has to be a crash now kind of mentality it's got to happen it's got to happen like mm. do you think that that's going to is that having an influence on people slowing down in what they've been doing not yet because it hasn't happened mm. um i think people really the the funny thing is to me if you mention you mentioned the social media the craziest thing to me is to go onto social media and see people talking about buy the dip. Well, literally the NASDAQ is only like a few hundred points off the, it's all time highs. That is not a dip. I mean, we've right. seen some dips. This is nothing. This is literally not a dip. So everybody is so programmed to think that any little sell off is, is a buy the dip. So I don't think we're anywhere near um, getting to a place where people are discouraged from, from all of this. That said, um, as far as predicting the crash, listen, I, I've been on the wrong side of market rallies long, enough to know that picking the top is really, really hard. Mm. Usually when, when all the signs are there, like for example, uh, we start seeing like overcrowded trades. Like we look at um, reports that the government puts out in the future side that tells you who's long and who's short and how much. When we start seeing overcrowded trades, that's like one signal when we start seeing sentiment readings just get ridiculously like everybody's bullish and nobody believes the market can sell off. That's another signal. But these things take months, sometimes a year to materialize. So good luck trying to go short the stock market and, you know, for an entire year before the crash actually ha happens. It, and what is a crash? I think March 2020 was a crash and some people don't categorize it as that. But for me, that was a crash. Even if we saw something like that again, which which I don't, um, th I'm not sure that that would be enough to satisfy. I mean, I've seen some people have been calling a crash since 2009, and <laughs> we've been in like a 12 year bull market. So right. I don't know. It's it's but, uh, it's one of those things of it, there are too many new variables mm -hmm. that have. I mean, the smart people are just, I think the smart people, uh, uh, from what I can see, are sitting back and saying, I have no idea. Yeah, well, for sure. Yeah, this is, I mean, we've never seen this before. So a lot of times we can say, oh, well, I've seen this movie before. This is what usually happens. But this is like all new territory. Um, it is important to keep in mind, though, people want to talk about stock market crashes and they're fearful that things are going to hit the fan and this and that. But literally the stock market only corrects more than 10 to 12%, like once every four years on average, um, maybe three years. So it's something that happens once every two to four years, but we talk about it literally all the time, yeah, especially yeah, yeah. in a situation like this. So you, uh, in the long run, you're better off not trying to predict a crash and, and just simply going with the flow, like as an investor. Me personally, like for my investment portfolio, mm -hmm. I'm really, really light. I went 
I'm not all cash, but I'm largely cash because I don't trust this market at all. But that doesn't mean I'm making the right decision. That's probably not the decision most people, like most everyday people should make. Um, but there's the market's definitely definitely vulnerable to a crash. But I would have said that two or three months ago and it just keeps right? going up. So and, and that's the thing. It's this yeah. is very strange. Has has the market it is evolved into a new phenomenon that none of us understand yet and because you look at it and you think well the fed just keeps printing money sure there are some definitely a lot of weird things between stimulus and um, infrastructure bills and just throwing money at it absolutely it it's doing nothing but inflating asset prices probably artificially or arguably artificially um so yeah, there's definitely some weird things going on, but the reality is at some point people have to start, like it's, we tend to forget this in these types of euphoria, euphorias, but the share of a stock represents the value of a company plus its future, future cash flows. So at some point we have to get back to that. <laughs> now, Does maybe that go? means the economy explodes. Eventually, yes. Does it, why? it? It could take a long That's time. That's the part I don't understand. Like, why well, isn't this a new normal? Well, because, okay, so markets are forward looking. The right. economy is not going to be contracting forever. Economies go in cycles. We go through contraction mm -hmm. and expansion, okay. so on and so forth. We've actually been, con uh, we've been growing for over a decade the longest cycle I think is like 12 years. So we're getting to the, probably the last two or three innings of this particular cycle. I mean, everybody will have a different opinion on that, mm. but eventually we're going to get to a point where we have a true recession. Now this, like this year or the last year, we, the government kind of manipulated our, <laughs> us out of a recession, right. but that, I mean, fake maybe prosperity. it can, Right, right. Maybe that can last forever, but I, I doubt it. It didn't work for Japan. Japan tried to do that and it actually ended up uh, like they were stagnant for a decade. So, you know, only time will tell. Who knows? Maybe, maybe it can go on forever, but I just can't imagine, uh, like you mentioned, a house of cards. That's what it feels like to me when yeah. we were printing money and throwing money and making assets go up just because for no reason other than just because we want them to. Doesn't seem right to me, but well, because a, a lot of it feels like they need their they need their mm -hmm. political agenda to be validated by look, we're in growth, right. right, right, fake growth. You know what's interesting to me? So we look at the the U.S. and we think like just how wild our government has gotten as far as uh, avoiding recessions and yeah. keeping money in everyone's pocket which so far, honestly, it's worked out pretty good. Everyone lives a pretty good lifestyle. In the long run, I think things aren't going to be quite that easy, but we'll see. But as crazy as we are, there are definitely crazier in the world. I don't know if you uh, followed China at all, but oh, yeah. a, about, a, I want to say 10, 15 years ago, China decided they wanted to pump up their economy and they built fake cities like yeah, yeah. all over the place. Like literally no one lives there, but there's apartment buildings and shopping malls. I mean, it's really insane what years, governments they do. Believe. It, it, from here, <laughs> it, in order, at the current growth rate mm -hmm. uh, of their population, it will take 61 years to populate all the cities that right. China I has, mean, has built out. Who even comes up with that stuff? That's totally insane. What? Well, uh -huh. it's part of that kind of, is it so insane? It's genius. You know, maybe is it, maybe is it, it is, yeah. Is it that they, they figured, well, if we build these cities at the current mm -hmm. rate of the right. um, of labor rates and the current, you know, price of all the, do they know something about the fact that the inputs <laughs> that are needed for that kind of growth mm -hmm. are going to go scarce and that they're taking, you know, advantage of well, that situation? I don't know. It's true. But it's yeah. one of those things. It's like, going to be interesting. These are not these are not stupid people. So is it, right. no, it's, it's, you know what I mean? It's like, it, yeah. do they know something that we don't know? Well, or yeah. I mean, only look time at, will tell. yeah, time will tell. I don't, I'm not that, I, I am not that um, 
aggressive, I guess. I can't imagine coming up with a scheme like that, but that's probably why I'll probably never be <laughs> like, I'm, I'll just live my little average it. life. <laughs> right. Yeah. It'll never happen. I just can't think of, think well, like that. A, you live in a, um, <laughs> like you live on the razor's edge of risk when it comes to all of <laughs> this stuff. It is true. It is true. I need you to help me understand something because I feel like a crazy woman every time I try to understand this particular thing. People keep saying to me, the economy is doing fabulously. Okay. And I ask them, do you mean the stock market's doing fabulously or the economy is <laughs> doing fabulously? Because I'm confused. Are they the same thing? No. And no. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Help they're me understand absolutely the not. The, they're right. absolutely not the same thing. I've seen times where, I mean, sometimes the stock market goes up when the economy is crappy and vice versa. It has nothing to do with it. The stock market is forward looking and they're trying to predict the future or, you know, it, there's all kinds of different things going on, but they're two separate animals for sure. And so what's the difference between the stock market and the economy? Well, okay. So the stock market is, I guess, is a prediction of what investors believe the economy will be at some point in the future. So if you remember, like in March, 2020, the stock market was crashing because uh, everyone was getting laid off. The, the world was shut down. We thought the economy was like going, I mean, it was just ridiculous. So the stock market started pricing in like draconian type yep. stuff. And then eventually it turned on a dime and started rallying when literally nothing has changed. Like here in Vegas, we were shut down from March to late, like July, mm -hmm. but yet the, the stock market step was booming because people realized it was only temporary and so on and so forth. So there's really a huge disconnect. The, as we already talked about, the stock market valuation is really a lot of it's based on emotions and predictions, right. which don't necessarily have to reflect the current situation in the economy. Whereas the, the economy is the actual books of the country, right? Right. The economy is actually the, the money changing hands and yeah. the, real, the real deal going on. So was it reasonable for people to expect that the economy would crash? Do you think? Um, yes, honestly, the, I, I, I tend to be a very optimistic person. So when all heck was breaking loose in March, I was still trying to look at the bright side and, and, and that I remember, sort of thing. But, I was telling you like, go yeah. home, leave yeah. New York right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, but yes, it was absolutely looking back. I'm really shocked that we've recovered as quickly Have and we as done? well as we have. Um, I definitely, I think that some of it's smoke and mirrors because we've got a lot of government money sloshing around, but all I can speak of is like my small business and talking to other small business owners. And, um, it's not as good. It definitely is not what it was mm -hmm. 2019, 2018, 2017, but guess what? It's a lot better than it was in like, let's awesome. say from 2008 to 2015. Right. So I mean, I, we'll see, but I, I still think we're, uh, we're still riding on government money. So we'll have to see what it looks like in five or six months. Mm -hmm. I do think, I think the stock market's way ahead of itself. I think that we're going to start coming back to um, reality. But with that said, I don't think the economy, I honestly, I think the economy is doing much better than most people could have imagined, which is I agree. Like I'm, I'm looking yeah. at it thinking, surely this shit's got to fall over. Surely with all this fake yeah. money being produced and it, it's going to have an effect on inflation, it's going, to, it's going to create a false sense of prosperity right. for people. But I'm not seeing that. that well, I am seeing the yeah. false sense of prosperity. I'm not seeing a correction. Well, what, there's a few good things that have come out of this. Like I believe that people have seen like, – in the United States, our society has a really bad habit of living beyond their means. People don't really? save. Come on now. Are you sure? <laughs> They're living. Come on now. <laughs> I mean, you probably don't believe this, but yeah. Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I it mean, was the thing I couldn't understand. The pandemic yeah. happened and people were like buying TVs. Yeah. I don't look, it, 
I'm pretty good with money. Like I'm a hoarder when it comes to my money. But that said, most people just, if it comes in, it goes right back out. And they literally are paycheck to paycheck. They can't, if an emergency happens, they can't fund it. I do think that this gave people an opportunity to save a little more, or at least open their eyes to the fact that, uh, yeah, you you have to feed your kids, even if something bad happens, you know? So I'm hoping that we've learned some lessons and people will be a little more stable going forward. I think that's true, but who knows? I hope so. People forget. I hope so too. You know, I operate in an industry that um, has far more zombie businesses than what it's aware of. Oh, like the coffee you? industry yeah, or yeah, yeah, the coffee okay. industry. Would you, would it shock you to know that coffee runs on 3% net profit? The, the cafes, cafes that, run yeah. 3% that, I profit. thought it was a little higher, but I, it doesn't shock me. I those types of businesses are, it's really hard. Yeah. Honestly, when I walk into small businesses that are food and beverage, the fir- I, that's the first thing I think of is, wow, they have to sell a lot of cookies or a lot of muffins just yeah. to, it's hard. It's a tough and business. The, like the, the margins just from a COGS perspective, the, the gross mm-hmm. margins are 60%. And people go into okay. these businesses just looking at the, oh my God, it's 60% profit. Right. No, no, no. Then you've got operating expenses. Yeah. And that's tough. Yeah. It's really, really tough. And so what happens is most of these businesses consistently exist paycheck to paycheck. Gotcha. Like they are living, they're barely scrape, scraping by right. every single month just to make a payroll. And so the pandemic comes mm-hmm. along and they're given you know, PPP and they're given, Mm -hmm. you know, government funding, which here the equivalent of PPP in Australia is JobKeeper Uh that expired yesterday. Oh, So we're going to start to see the ramifications of that over the next couple of months. So the Australian government was paying small businesses, Mm -hmm. whatever a percentage it was, I can't remember, for their... uh, for the employees' wages. Same thing okay. as what was going on okay. in what's going on in the but US. But if everything's pretty much open there, it's still, it's, did their revenues really, aren't they similar there to what they sh- were pre? There was a shift. So for, so for example, the travel industry won't recover from this. You know, it, our yeah. borders are going to yeah. be closed for quite some time. Uh, mm-hmm. We have, we have, we are riding off the back of eight weeks of zero cases zero community transmission yeah and now we've got the beginnings of an outbreak and we have no immunity in this country yeah that's true which is scary yeah okay so it's going to get very interesting yeah all right what happens and so Hmm. what they've what they've realized is so all the cases of covid in this country exist in hotel quarantine so we've managed to, up until now, keep it out of the population. Mm-hmm. But our vaccination rates are going much slower than anticipated. And gotcha. they've just come out and, um, with studies that show that the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is the vaccine that we have mm-hmm. 52 million doses of in a population of 24 million people, because it's manufactured right. here, it has zero um, or close to zero efficacy against the South African strain. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. It's the perfect potential storm, right? Yeah. I think it, yeah. So the travel industry is fucked because of <laughs> that. They, they, yeah. they, those are the businesses that are going to, uh, once now the job keeper is gone, they will actually start yeah. to be uh, revealed as zombie businesses. The coffee industry, what you've seen is from all the more densely populated uh, areas where people haven't returned to working in their buildings, they're still working from home because now that's more cost effective for the small business owner. Mm -hmm. You've seen a shift in geography of, so where our CBD or our downtown areas where you had people that were doing 130 kilos of coffee a week 
mm-hmm. uh, which is which is high for anyone who doesn't know. That's they were doing that much a week. Yeah. Um, they're now doing zero. They've closed down. So they were highly profitable businesses. Oh, wow. That uh, were high revenue generating businesses have now gone to zero because people no longer work in those areas at all. And and there were so many businesses operating at that level in those densely populated areas. Those Mm. consumers have now gone to work from home. So community cafes or suburban cafes are doing Mm -hmm. better. Previously, they were on the brink of Mm. closing. So JobKeeper was keeping those cafes that were in the downtown areas. It was keeping their people employed. Now they're going to go. Yeah. It's crazy how the winners and losers are emerging. It's really wild. Yeah. And I think what we're going to start to see is government. Oh, hold on. I was going to say governments can't keep printing money, but can't (laughs) they? Because it seems to be the thing. Well, eventually there's going to be consequences. Like everyone, honestly, the U S government started printing money hand over fist in like 2009. So this has been going on here for a long while. And honestly, globally, it's pretty much been the same story since, since the financial crisis so far, we haven't really seen any runaway inflation. In fact, it's kind of almost been the opposite problem. Deflation has been a bigger risk than inflation, which is completely opposite of what everyone learned in their finance college classes. So I mean, at this point, um, they're just, they'll probably just keep printing until there's a consequence. Now, I hope that that consequence doesn't come all at once and overwhelm everybody, but so far that just really hasn't even been, you know, they've, they've spent a decade really worrying about that. That just never happened. Um, in fact, you may or may not remember, but in the U S in like 2017, 2018, our federal reserve started raising interest rates unnecessarily, really. And they kind of like really Trump um, thwarted, happy. yeah, they thwarted our economy and then they panicked and realized, wait, that was the wrong thing. But the only reason they did that is they were worried about inflation, which really never, ever came anyway. So uh, yeah, I think, and now because they learned that lesson, or at least they think they learned that lesson, now they maybe they'll learn a different lesson this time. I don't know. But now our Fed is basically saying, we're just going to leave rates as is. We don't have any intention of raising whatsoever unless we actually see some inflation print. They're not going to try to get ahead of it. They're just going to let it, you know, let everything overheat and then try to deal with it after. So it feels uh, like, it feels like there was a theme in 2020 that started emerging and, but more so in 2021. And I've started, Mm -hmm. it uh, started noticing it in a lot of my clients uh, and in a lot of kind of, the way that societies are talking about what's happening. It feels as though all of the shit that we've all kicked down the road, you know, that we keep kicking the can down the sure. road. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All of that, like the roads ended <laughs> and we now have yeah. to kind of hold to account a lot of the shit that we've been just like, right. it won't, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Right. The economy is no different, right? No, and no, and we've, like you said, we've been kicking the can down the road for years. Um, The thing about in the US is because we have elections every four years, unfortunately, our our Mm -hmm. politicians, I mean, why would they fix a problem when they can just leave it for the next one? Because honestly, I mean, it's not right, but you can see why they would think that way. They're, you know, they don't want to be the bad guy. And so they want to get elected. um, That's the goal. Right. They're trying to get four people. Oh, no, absolutely. No, it's not. Our government does not work for us anymore. That's we've learned that. But um, yeah, someone will have to pay the piper someday. I don't know when. Right. And like, yeah. My big like heart in my throat thing is like the people who have it's the people who are going to pay are always the people who can't afford to pay. Uh, Yes. Historically, I feel that's like that's what it's been. The people yeah. who, who cause the problem typically get saved or have parachutes somehow. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, there's so many, like the problem itself is so big and uh, so and intertwined and everything. Yeah. That it, there's no, you know, there's no simple um, explanation or solution. But with that said, I do see that, um, 
you're right. Like it's going to be the the lower end of like the income spectrum that ends up paying a lot of a lot of the the price to this. Um, unfortunately, like we've already kind of talked about in this, for whatever reason, uh, the the gambling mentality and the speculation and things like that tends to. I mean, I'm not saying wealthy people don't do that because they do. We just had, there was just a family office that blew up a few weeks ago that was like some guy that basically trading his and his family's money and lost a uh, hundred billion dollars or something. I don't know what it was, but oh, this and is, uh, took down some, hand, almost right? took, yeah, and almost took down some brokerage firms with him. So th- it goes on both ends. I'm not saying that, yeah, but yeah. it the people that have money can afford to get into a little bit of trouble and then and, and just survive and keep going on with their life. Whereas on the lower end, they can't. So if they make a big mistake, um, you know, dabbling in the markets with money they can't afford, it's literally just a, a never ending cycle that that's impossible to get out of. But um, you're right. They're generally the ones that, that'll probably pay the price. With regards to your area of expertise, uh, commodities. Okay. When, when we look at like all the weirdness that's going on in the world uh, with regards to climate shifting, with regards to uh, the pandemic, with regards to people starting to have some time to pay attention to shit uh, because okay. they're stuck at home, you know, mm-hmm. uh, watching too many YouTube videos. Right. Do people... Do, do people in your industry factor in that the world is changing in the way that you run your businesses or do you have to react to that? Uh, our business is so fast paced that I think sometimes we all get caught up in just surviving today reacting. and don't, uh, yeah, and reacting and not being proactive and seeing the big, the big overall changes. Mm. Um, but there's definitely, I mean, there's definitely shifts in the way people think as far as like, for example, um, which this was, this kind of blew my mind. Obviously we all live on the planet. We want to preserve the planet. We all care about the environment and some, but what, shocked me was suddenly I started getting all these inquiries about people interested in Bitcoin, but they didn't, they wanted to buy Bitcoin, but their hesitation wasn't because maybe they might lose money. Their hesitation was because of the it, mining energy. Yes. Because of the energy. And I'm like, wait, it's what? So fucking asinine. <laughs> Sorry. I know. I was just like, huh? And then, so I got that question once I'm like, okay, that's just a one-off whatever. And then the, like three or four it's times coming. it kept coming. And I'm like, what is going on? This is crazy. <laughs> this was, I heard this on Rogan um, <laughs> yesterday when he was talking to a climber from Vegas. Okay. And, and he was saying, no, I'm opposed to Bitcoin because of the energy and efficiency in, <laughs> and he was saying, mark yeah. my words, Bitcoin's not going to be a thing. It's a fad. It's not going to be a thing because people are going to recognize that it's it's too it, too expensive from an energy cost right. perspective. And then Jamie turned around and said to him, "Bro, <laughs> <laughs> it's more expensive to create fiat currency <clears throat> from an energy perspective yeah. than it is to create Bitcoin." But the other thing is, like yeah, the reason it, it, Bitcoin co- um, costs so much money from an energy perspective is not to trade bitcoin it's to mine bitcoin right and bitcoin has mm-hmm. a limited amount of, uh, right. of coins and so at some mm-hmm. point we're no longer going to need to mine the bitcoin it's all going to be mined sure. and the yep. there's going to be a new phase of the bitcoin era mm-hmm. but it's really right. interesting that people care about that but they don't give a well, fuck about what's happening with other parts of people pick and choose what they want to care about but well, and it's so funny at the time, like one guy asked me this question literally as Bitcoin was printing 62,000. So it was like at an all time high, Yeah. like your biggest worry should be, am I the last buyer? Like, am I going to buy at 62 and it's going down to 20,000? You know what I mean? But yeah. he, he had, that wasn't even a concern. That wasn't even part of the conversation. So 
yeah, I, I I'm learning that, as I go. That brings <clears throat> up a really interesting thing uh, of how people grab these little headline things. Oh, and, yeah. And they suddenly become an expert in that headline <laughs> because they read the headline, <laughs> not the story. Right, right. Yes, that happens a lot. I imagine that's happening uh, at a faster pace as we go. Right. With regards to Bitcoin, mm-hmm. I didn't know that you could trade on the futures of Bitcoin. Yes. Okay. So there is a futures contract, but it's really big. It's five Bitcoin is one futures contract. What? So yeah. So it prices everybody out. Like it's just too expensive and too risky for most people to trade, but they are uh, creating a mini or I think they're calling it either a mini or a micro. I don't know, but the exchange is going to list it on, I want to say May 1st or May 3rd, early May. It'll be a mini and the margin's probably only going to be a couple thousand. So it'll be basically accessible to everyone. And so if anyone wants to get into Bitcoin, I really highly recommend that you go through the futures route just simply because like I said, the exchange guarantees the transactions, everything is regulated. The And I'm not saying heavy regulation is always the answer because that's not, but it's good to have some eyes looking to make sure yeah. everything, the exchange is centralized, it's fair, it's transparent, you're not getting any hanky panky going on. So um, it's just a safer place to trade. And you know, if you sell your position and you make money and you ask for your money back, you're gonna get it because legally Guaranteed you have to. <laughs> yeah, exchange. right. So, right. so help me understand something. That's not actually trading Bitcoin though, is it? Like you're not actually buying Bitcoin, <clears throat> you're betting on the position that Bitcoin's going to hold you're, at a future. You, yeah, right? you're okay. So you're buying a contract that represents a certain amount of Bitcoin. It will follow the price of Bitcoin. It's not technically like, it's not like you have a wallet and you're holding the, right. the coin somewhere. No, you're just holding an agreement to transact it at a specific date in the future. Um, so it's a little bit different, but it's not but like- you take ownership of the Bitcoin? Um, it's cash settled. So you cannot take ownership. Okay. It, um, I, be- I believe that, I don't want to say they have any Bitcoin backing it. So they don't. I don't know exactly what the, the end of the, honestly, it's a new contract. So I, yeah, it hasn't even been listed yet. Sounds, so I'm not hundred percent sure. Yeah. How I, I, I'm pretty sure it's cash settled, which means it's going to be tied to the price and it'll fluctuate in real time with the price, but it's not like you could take delivery of the Bitcoin. No, no. So that's going to be different to say something like a physical commodity, like coffee. Um, right? There, Yeah. Most, most commodities are deliverable. There are a few that aren't like, for example, lean hogs for whatever reason are cash settled, not deliverable. What? Yeah. But the market's still, I mean, people. But a hog's like, a physical thing. They are, but for some, for whatever reason, it's just always been done that way. So they are cash settled, but the, even the cash settled contracts follow the, the cash market price, because if they didn't like, let's say that there's a Bitcoin future here and Bitcoin, like on the cash market and uh-huh. somebody's wallet over here. If Bitcoin on the futures market, if the price was deviating from the actual Bitcoin, then someone would buy this and sell that or vice versa. And they would arbitrage it. So the, the, the prices stay in balance. Okay. It's not like they drift apart and do their own thing. But if you wanted to use the futures market <clears throat> to trade this way, it's not as though you're going to end up with Bitcoin in your wallet. Correct. No, you would yeah. just benefit or lose from the price change. From Correct. The price change. So yep. you're using fiat currency to bet on. Yeah. Correct. The, this Which is why I'm saying I'm dangerous with a little bit of for knowledge. The, yeah. So for the diehards that might defeat the purpose, but the reality is at least you're not gambling with like whether or not your cur- cryptocurrency brokerage is actually going to pay you your money. Right. So. Have you got Bitcoin? Me personally, no. I'm not a big fan of Bitcoin. Um, not, I'm not, I don't dislike it or like it. I just, I never knew enough about it to dabble it. And I kept seeing the price move to like stupid levels and I would, And then come down and then go back. Yeah. Up. It's, I mean, to me, it's a trading vehicle. Uh, nothing more than that. Like, it's not like people are using it to buy and sell things. I know they're like, I know some companies are starting to offer that. In fact, there's a a vending machine or a, an ATM machine in Vegas, a Bitcoin one, but the bid ask spread is so wide that like it just right. eats your money anyway. So right. 
it's it's uh, uh, going to be interesting to see how the dynamic shifts. Like now you can buy Tesla with Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. We have it so that you can actually, when Elixir was uh, operating in America, you could mm-hmm. buy Elixir with Bitcoin. Oh, I didn't know that. See, yeah. here's my thing though. As a business, I wouldn't, I'm not sure I would do it. Like what if Bitcoin goes down? Like what if someone pays you for your service or your good and then suddenly I'm playing it drops? With it. Gotcha. So, okay. so for me, I, I think that um, I've had enough conversations with very intelligent people. I'm speaking mm-hmm. to one of them about this stuff to help mm-hmm. me understand that the world is dynamic and it's shifting. Mm-hmm. And in order to be adaptable, you've got to have uh, some financial literacy about a few different things. And I wasn't sure. taught this coming up, you know, like the idea yeah. of a portfolio, the word just confused me <laughs> because it wasn't something that, yeah. um, you know, my family's made money. My family's lost money. My family's had businesses. Mm-hmm. My family families had jobs. Like it's, it's one of those things of I didn't quite understand the vehicles that people were using to get wealthy for whatever sure. wealthy means, right? And mm-hmm. so I, I kind of think that taking my risk ap- appetite into consideration, I can't do get-rich-quick schemes. Sure. The, the the anxiety behind it doesn't work for me and I just don't think it's <laughs> nor um, should you <laughs> well you yeah. know I come from a family of gamblers like my okay. whole extended family are big gamblers and I I won I put fifty dollars into a poker machine once I won and then mm-hmm. the next fifty dollars I put into the machine I lost and I went oh I get this <laughs> this is trickery and fuckery yeah and I'm not going to win at this. And so I realized yeah. at that moment, like this bores me and I'm not going to do it. The thing going forward for me is if I'm going to look at any of that kind of stuff, it needs to be something that's going to pay off in my retirement. Sure. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Is it? I have no idea. The one thing I do know is that I think that the world that we're going to be living in in that time is going to look very different to the world that we live in now simply because I think people are feeling more empowered. Mm. A lot of that empowerment is with a lot of ridiculous knowledge. <laughs> it's not it's not knowledge that yeah. like you don't have to be truthful anymore. Sure, oh, I know. Yeah. Right? So if you don't have to speak the truth and you're not held accountable to your words, we live in like it's the wild, wild west out there. I know. Tell me about it. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> you, you're on the receiving end of a lot of it. I see the comments on your yeah. Facebook posts. <laughs> Some of the shit that I read on there is like, they said, what? Like, it's yeah. really, really interesting. But because <laughs> of like, I'm an observer of humans. And so when I watch what's going on, I think, oh, the landscape, we're not living by the rules that, got society to where it is now Mm -hmm. and i think that it's going to be really interesting to see the way that people interpret the value of different things you know i i think the people are going to start holding i mean people perceive wealthy people as Mm -hmm. wealthy whether they're wealthy or not yeah you know, just because you, you trade in stocks, apparently now you're wealthy. Right. People, people have no idea. People assume that, yeah, you're right. If you're in a certain industry or a certain business, you're just magically. Most people assume if you own your own business, then you must be rich, which is, we all know, that's not how it works. That's it's not how it works. such a load of shit, isn't it? <laughs> in fact, a lot of times it's the opposite. Like your blood, sweat, and tears, yep. but not a lot of money coming in it for that. I mean, it is what it is. And it's up and down after that. I have, um, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just saying, so like in, in my business, I mean, it's with honestly, most businesses, like literally 90 to 95% of businesses fail. That's just how it is. It's the same in the brokerage business. So there's not many of us stand like 
I've been there. Okay. So when you build a brokerage business, you have to build a book of clients. That's how you make your money is, you know, uh, if you can't just have one client or you, you need a whole bunch of them. And it takes a long time to build that for various reasons, like leaving, other, leaving brokerages and, um, I was actually, there's, it's a long story, but I don't know if you know this, but I was once on American Greed because myself and my brokerage was a victim of, uh, yeah, we were like frauded by a a brokerage firm that we were clearing all of our trades with. And it turned out to be a big Ponzi scheme. So yeah. So between that and a couple other things, basically I've rebuilt my book uh, three times. Each time it took six to eight months of working for free, like no money, just working eight months, 16 hours a day, hoping that one day maybe some money will come in. So uh, it's definitely not easy when it's- And the bills don't stop. Like you still got to pay- No. You still got to pay electricity. You still got to pay, you've still got to eat. Although you start eating brown rice at that point, right? Right. So yeah, so I've, yeah, you live to, you learn to, you know, uh, limit yourself to what you, what you can afford. And eventually I hope that mo- somebody that, uh, I mean, I hope that all small businesses at some point find a way to succeed because I can't imagine doing all of that and never seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. That's just heartbreaking to me, but it's, you know, uh, I just also wish that people understood how much goes into owning a small business. It's not like it's, we, it's, people don't just fall into, um, their situation, they built it and the money's not, it just doesn't just flow in. There's, there's all kinds of things going on behind the scenes. Well, yeah. And you go from being, you go from a job where the expectation is Mm -hmm. that I'm going to do my work and the money's going to appear in my bank account as my wages. Right. Yeah. You don't have to worry about how that money's getting made. (laughs) When you, once you become the small business owner and you have to come Mm -hmm. up with your own salary, all of a sudden, even if it's the same amount of money, yeah. that amount of money has a whole different definition. Sure. Yeah, it's a reality check for sure. Business coaching is, for me, a gr- it's the greatest joy of everything that I do. Like I, my podcasts are my favorite thing to do. But the business coaching is, it's a wonderful opportunity to help people get very real very quickly about the endeavor that they're embarking on so that we can manage their expectations about how challenging the future is going to be. Right. I think that when people have more control over how they're earning their money and how they're creating that money, mm-hmm. they get a better understanding of what the value of that money really means. You know, so I if agree. you have to, yeah. if you have to like, make that money appear out of nowhere so that you can pay your wages all of a sudden that's so much harder and people really underestimate the the challenge of doing that right Uh, absolutely well and yeah and most people like you said they they think you just show up and if you're there then money you know because that's what if you work nine to five at a for somebody else that's what happens right whether you work or not if you're there if you're clocked in you get paid Pay but, me my money, bitch. Yeah. Like, that's what they <laughs> I'm say, here. Right? It's all the rap yeah. songs are saying it. <laughs> yeah, but as a small business owner, you have to actually produce and then you have to produce enough to cover your expenses. And then then if you're and lucky, the there's something left over. And the taxes, yep. Oh, oh. Trust me, I lived in California. Those taxes. Oh, oh my God. I could not I could never do it. That's that's the great thing about living in Nevada. We don't have uh, um state income taxes so that helps and also because of the casinos our property taxes are low so it's a really low tax state which is yeah. why i'll probably never leave well, <laughs> california is brutal that's uh, brutal it, it's brutal and it's turning into mad max well yes and a lot of the californians are moving to nevada which is fine but they're moving really quickly so they're pumping up our real estate prices jamming up our freeways oh, <laughs> well they love but, jammed up freeways in california yeah so they feel right at home but it's a little bit frustrating for the, the natives yeah no no doubt and you know californians can be frustrating to any natives anyway <laughs> right it's, it's no comment kind of... <laughs> yeah. i still live here so i'm not gonna say yeah, anything. right 
Well, you, you can always just come to Sydney. You always yeah. have a home here. So I have to do that. Yeah, you will. So um, in wrapping up, tell me something. 12 months from now. Okay. Are we happy? Are we terrified? Or are, are we indifferent? Well, as an optimist, I think I plan on being happy. I, I don't think, to be honest, I'm not expecting to ever um, have the kind of, well, not, I don't want to say ever. The economy was really booming in like 2017 through 2019. Honestly, it was, for our industry, it was almost like the Christmas. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're like, what is, what is going on? Um, but I'll be happy if we if things are just mediocre, I'll be happy with. So, because I mean, this is, we, we want to pretend like we've uh, printed our way out of this fiasco, but I really think that we have some deep scars in the economy and I think yeah. it'll take a long time to work everything out. So I'm not saying we have bread lines and everything goes to crap. I'm just saying we, it's probably going to be stagnant. We're not going to, uh, see the growth rates that we've seen in the last handful of years, but I'm okay with that. I mean, considering what we've gone through, anything seems like a gift, right? Right. I, it's hard That's to be pessimistic. That's the optimist in you. Yeah. Now right. I want to hear from the realist. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Well, <laughs> what does the realist in you say? Um, I mean, the reality is like, so I live in an area which is very interesting because the hardest hit part of the economy was tourism and hospitality. And that's Just literally nice. what we are. That's what we do. It has been heartbreaking to see what's yeah. happened to our city. Um, you can blame it on the virus. You can blame it on the politicians, whatever. It doesn't matter now. It, what's done is done. But we, we literally just disintegrated the strip for six months. It's starting to reopen now, but it's a really slow process. And in the meantime, even though things are trying to normalize and trying to open back up, um, the homeless population has grown, the, a lot of crime has come in. So the dynamics are just really, really different than what they were pre-pandemic. So it's not going to be as easy as just flipping the lights on and everything go back to normal because tourists that come here are going to have different experiences because of the changes that have gone on. And it's going to take a while to, yep. to work that all out of the system. Um, so I, we've got a lot of work ahead of us, but I think, listen, if, if we can survive 2020 in the, I mean, just imagine what we've been through. If we're still here talking about it today, You're we right. can survive anything. And, so. and smiling, like, like right. it's, it's very difficult being in Australia and trying to, like people are like, that must have been wild being in America during 2020. And, and I start to kind of like go into some of the, the stories and that you just need to stop talking. They cannot fathom. It's, they cannot fathom oh, what, it, what it was like yeah. and continues to be like in America. There are no words. Now I'm lucky because here in Vegas, like we're a city, but we're not a huge city. So like you were more probably urban area. Yep. Here, I can literally jump in my car and be on the mountain in 20 minutes. So I can get out, get fresh air. And that's what I did during the entire shutdown. I went hiking yep. um, all over the place. And I saw all kinds of things that I wouldn't have forced mm -hmm. myself to go explore otherwise. So actually, it was really awakening. And um, it was nice. And in some ways, it I mean, it's transformative for you. I got to be yeah. honest, as, as someone who is a friend from yeah. afar, I watched you through social media and it seemed like this was kind of like a, a grounding and a transformative epiphany it, for you. It put things into perspective. So yeah. b my business and my work is always going to be my number one priority, but this was definitely a reminder that nothing is guaranteed. We, you just have to live life to the fullest. And so I had an opportunity to, to get out and do that. And um, honestly, I, I look at the world a little differently now. Yeah, and I do awesome. think, um, I think I'm a little kinder and more um, aware of other people around me, like what they're feeling and thinking now. And I think that other people in the community are the same way. So I think there's some good that's come out of all of this that's wonderful. garbage. Yeah. I mean, you were, you all have always uh, come across to me as someone who's like that. We could always be more like that though. 
Oh, for sure. Well, I was, I mean, I still am and to, to my fault. I'm always the type that I'm just put my head down and work and then whatever happens around me is whatever. Yeah. But, um, you know, I've kind of lightened up on that a little bit and I think You're that's probably a, a good thing. Yeah. See what else is going on. Nice. Enjoy life. Yeah. Well, I hope this time next year that all your predictions come true. Um, Me too. Yeah. Because I'm not a positive person. I'm not going to negative person <laughs> either. I'm I'm a well, I'm just a realist. Like I'm just somebody who looks at it and says this is this is what it is. But right. the future we don't, isn't part of what's real. Like the future, I don't mm -hmm. know what's coming. I I, I hope get that. your predictions are where we end up playing. I hope so too. One, just one thing that I've also learned through this is we, I can't, I have no control over anything that's going on around me as much as I want to think I do. I don't. And so that really was also a big game changer for me is just realizing really? that. Yeah. Cause I mean, just think about what <laughs> it, I never in, see now I'm super, super lucky because my small business was able to operate almost as nor Contrast. almost normally. Yeah. Yeah, because I, you know, we can stay in our little office and do our thing and everything's electronic. No big deal. We don't, we're not dealing with people face to face, but we're lucky. So I, you know, a lot of my friends weren't so lucky. They lost their life savings, try, you know, with their small businesses. And that was um, really heartbreaking to me because they had no control over that. It wasn't anything they did. It was yeah. when the government switches lights off, that was it. And I'm not questioning their decision. I'm just saying it is what it is. I never before even imagined that that was a possibility that the government could come in and say, you're done, you're out of business or you're, you're at least on pause. And then you're essential you know, I or just, not essential. Like that one was an interesting one, right? Like who, yeah, who determines who, who is essential and who's not essential. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of any government policy, whether it's taxation or like picking winners and losers and every government policy picks winners and losers, yeah. but I hate it because it, it's just so random. And sometimes it's not random. Sometimes it, there's an agenda behind it, but it's, it's unfortunate. An interesting part of what you were saying with regards to that, the government observing what's happening here in Australia versus mm -hmm. the way it's been happening in America. Here, if we have, like we shut down the city for five cases. Okay. Every, everything shuts down and everybody's compliant. The reason we're compliant here is because mm -hmm. we don't want it to turn into what it is. <laughs> you, we've been the example. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, I was talking to yeah. my mother about it. She said, it's here. Mm -hmm. just from the beginning when it, she said it was so scary they told us that we couldn't even drive to visit each other and if we did we would get fined mm -hmm. and it was it felt terrible at the time but the result of it is yeah our society has gone back to normal sure yeah. and so because it worked people have right. taken a really positive kind of perspective from that and mm -hmm. i'm a libertarian so for, for me, it's kind of one of those weird things of, and, and as an Australian, we mm. were raised to be a more compliant society, but we question a lot in a more compliant kind of way. It's almost right. like there's this weird line of like, we figured <laughs> out that when they, they don't pull the stops here mm -hmm. for sensationalizing the media, right? right? So they'd never pull that card unless it was necessary. They pulled the card Mm -hmm. everyone reacted and it worked we've ended up with zero cases and we ended up with zero cases yeah. for a long time i get the sense though that if these couple of cases that have come out mm -hmm. they have crossed state lines and what happened was a nurse who was dealing with quarantine went to a bridal shower oh shoot and happened to to be sitting next to somebody. So she crossed state lines, went to a bridal shower, happened to be sitting next to somebody and had passed COVID onto him and he has gone somewhere else. Mm. And it's what started off as five cases. The government is saying, look, we don't want to overreact now and shut the whole of New South Wales down for what's going on. But right. we are going to monitor this and 
and here, if you walk into an establishment, you've got to register that you're at the establishment with a QR code. So hmm. in Queensland, it's working really well as long yeah. as it requires everyone to comply though and just register mm. their their whereabouts. So in the state north of where I am, uh, in Queensland, they shut the city down so that they could do all the contact tracing for three days. And it seems to be this weird kind of thing that's working. Mm -hmm. And you look at like, okay, why couldn't it work in America? Well, because it just (laughs) fucking wouldn't. (laughs) There's too much identity politics going on. There's too many teams. There's too much chaos. There's too much chaos for anyone to want to want order. Right. It's chaotic. Well, and in our defense, like we have, you know, we're not surrounded by oceans. We have, not exactly. you know, there's people come, even if we shut everything down immediately, there still would have, our borders are too porous. And, well, and I mean, shoulda, woulda, coulda. Yeah, that's, it, no, it, it wouldn't have. It right. just wouldn't have been You're tolerated. Right. In, and and if, even if you tried to close the borders between states. Yeah. You know. I mean, it's yeah, it doesn't, it wouldn't work. It just can you imagine that? I mean, <laughs> no. they stormed the Capitol building. What the fuck do you yeah. think they're gonna do if someone turns around and says, it wouldn't. No, you can't leave Alabama, right? Yeah, no, you it's can't come probably not into work. Texas. Imagine trying to tell people in Texas what they can and can't. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, look, that's the thing. Everybody, and the weird thing about this country is to every area has completely different cultures and. There should ideas be different and countries. every set should yeah. be a different country. There's a lot of stuff going on. Well, hopefully we never have to deal with this again. Maybe this was just a one-off and now we can move on and live again. I, I really want to ask you, and I'm gonna ask you, do you believe that? <laughs> uh as far as like You're a, a really pan- the pandemic. <laughs> the I, honestly it's pretty it's a little bit scary because. I feel like they this reaction this time went over. And honestly, the first couple months, most people complied, at least yeah, where I did. am. Like people were and scared and it was San Diego too. Yeah. I mean, it yeah, people were just like locked in their houses, not even going to the grocery store. Yeah. So for a temporary, but I'm kind of surprised that people were so compliant in the beginning. But now that the government's done this once, I feel like maybe you know, the next bird flu, maybe the, you know what I mean? Who knows? They, that's government's the like power. About it, right. Like yeah. if, if a virus, so the South African strain is more mm-hmm. contagious and, right. and more, you know, it, it puts people in hospital more. And so sure. what people are saying is if it really does start right. to get into it, if it does become the majority of the transmission, People part two, part two. (laughs) Yeah, Mm. it feels like part sixteen by now. You know, like it just feels like there've been so many iterations of this pandemic all in one. It's kind of like, oh fuck, I'm so tired. And I think that people are so over this that Mm -hmm. people are declaring the pandemic over. Like Texas is a hundred percent open. Saudi Arabia is a hundred percent open, but Saudi Arabia have more cases now than they've ever had. And it's yeah. like people that their their tolerance mm-hmm. for their life being stifled is just done. And so if we yeah. do end up with a completely different, um, a completely different virus, even and not even a coronavirus, but just another pandemic of some sort, people are going to turn around and go, sure. "Fuck that! Not doing that again." Yeah, I don't. Well, yeah, I don't think. I am 100% positive that another shutdown would not work in the U.S. I just think you're right. Nobody, nobody would go for it. But honestly, I mean, I know everybody has different opinions, but the statistics, like if you look from state to state, the states that were on complete lockdown and the states were, that were completely open, there's really no difference. Like the end results are kind of the same. Well, Cases they, might be a little different, but deaths should- per million are the same. So were they? 
Because the studies that I saw showed that uh, if you warm, well, it was a bunch of things in, in, in tandem, that if you wore mm-hmm. masks and socially distance and stayed home if you were sick, then mm-hmm. there was a net positive result to hospitalization rates. There, honestly, there's so many different factors. It right. could be weather, population density. So there's so many things going on. But like, if you just take the pure numbers, like death per million, and if you look at New York, New Jersey, Florida, Texas, California, which are like two states that were pretty lackadaisical, and then other states that were complete lockdown. Mm-hmm. And deaths per million are the same, or even uh, even the open states did better, but their landscapes are a lot different. So right. I don't know. I mean, honestly, you can crunch the numbers any way you, any well, way you want, but information bias is a, is a fabulous thing. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm not a doctor or a scientist or a st- statistician, but to me on the surface, it seems like the net benefit of a, com- of, I mean, you're like, Australia is completely different. That's a whole yeah. different ball game where, where but are we US, all of these. with what we're doing. Yeah. Like the really strict States had only a very marginal marginal difference compared to the open states and in the meantime they ruined a lot of people's lives so i mean i can see arguments on both ways and i'll never forget one mental health issues yeah yeah the suicide rate all of that Mm -hmm. remember right at the beginning when we were texting and you're like you know what the confusing thing is i've spoken to scientists who have completely opposing yeah yeah remember that and they're yes absolutely they're very smart I mean, they're very intelligent, but they completely different conclusions. So (laughs) who are we to, what are we Right. Yeah. (laughs) We're just along for the ride. A little bit of information makes you very dangerous, but we're in a wild ride. It's been a wild ride. Yeah. And it will continue to be so. I don't think we're done yet. I think that we are going to go through a, a period of false prosperity. And then I think that we're going to get to the end of the road that we've been kicking the can down. And mm-hmm. I think we're going to have to start paying the piper. I don't know what that looks like. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, people are going to react differently. I think that there are going to be people who throw tantrums because, you know, they've had such a great ride and now they have to balance <laughs> that out somehow. And, right. you know, they they yeah. are going to have to pay the piper. Um for some people it's going to be financial and other people is going to be with other things. Sure. My motto at this point is live within your means, save, be prepared. Good. <laughs> That's really Good. the only way to survive. So. There's a reason Warren Buffett is not spending the massive right. amounts of cash that he has. Correct. Right. Yeah. I mean, at some point, you got to believe that these people know what the fuck they're doing. You know, he's actually like, getting a lot of flack lately for his style because he's, right. you know, everyone else is making money hand over fist, blindly throwing money at stocks. But um, he's been around long enough. He knows he knows the game. And he's such an even keeled kind of man when it comes to this mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah. You know, I look at someone like him and I'm like, he's either very nervous about what's coming or right. he knows something that we don't know. Right. Well, he looks for value and never quite honestly, everything's overvalued. So it's, it's really that I actually felt really sorry for him. So um, I happened to, you know, my personal investment portfolio going into the crash last year, I was, uh, I wasn't going to, I'm not gonna say I was all cash, but I was really, really light on stocks because I kind of wasn't comfortable with the valuations. And I was super lucky to have had the money on the sidelines to get it you know, start putting it to work yeah. on the dip. And it turned out to be work out very well. Warren Buffett had the exact same idea, but the problem with him is he like, I'm dealing with a small amount of, you know, my personal portfolio, he's dealing with so much money. It, you can't just throw all that money into the market in the blink of an eye. This correction was really weird. It happened really fast. Like the whole correction was a month. Mm-hmm. And then when it turned, it literally one day, it just turned around and started going up and did not stop. Like it rallied. And it hasn't stopped. Not really. I mean, the first two or three weeks was like 25% or something crazy like that. So a poor, you know, someone like Warren, who was, he got the ball rolling, he was starting to shop around. But by the time he started 
making any moves it was already too late so it's it, it was I, very interesting am i right in understanding that someone with his kind of money once he does start to engage like that could be some market shifting money yeah but I, he doesn't he's like a i mean in the past he's more of a a slow roller he's not the mm-hmm. type to just throw it all in and so i mean he definitely could if he wanted to but he's more of a slow game but I mean, in his defense, he's been doing this a long time and we've never seen a correction that fast and then a reversal that fast. Usually when a market sells off like that, people are scared. And so the market trolls around and usually dribbles lower for six months to Mm. a couple of years before it starts going up. So, you know, he probably thought based on history, he probably thought he had months to years (laughs) to start putting money to work and he literally had a day. So it it was pretty wild ride. Yeah, it's very it's very interesting to watch people have opinions about what what, what Warren Buffett is doing. <laughs> right. You, you know what I mean? Like yeah. there's, well, there's so many every... YouTube videos that have opinions. This is why he's doing this and this is why he's doing that. Yeah. I'm like, I wonder if any of these people have asked. Well, and it's usually criticism, right? Right. But a lot of people are criticizing him, but guess what? He has more money than all of us. So whatever right. he's doing, he's doing something right. <laughs> Yeah, and and people want to criticize people who do their own thing. Take that from me as I have, I cop that a lot. When when you're somebody who goes left while everybody's going right, Mm -hmm. or you go up when everybody's going down, you're the person who's going to be on the receiving end of a whole ton of hate. For sure. For no reason, just because you're holding some weird mirror up to people that makes them look like they're doing. It means you're doing something right, though. If you're going along with the crowd that's that's never good you're just a puppet then aren't you yeah exactly you and i are not puppets <laughs> which is I why would, we're friends i would like to think no but <laughs> <laughs> that's why we can be friends <laughs> right <laughs> carly thank you so much i hope i sure. didn't sound like a total idiot trying to keep no. up with all your wonderful speak um, of course not if people want to get in contact with you how do they do that uh, my website is decarlytrading.com. So if you want to learn, there's videos. There's I mean, so let much me, content. there's so much content, a lot of educational material, because first of all, what we do is, is, is not something that most people should do. Like it, it's risk capital only. Not everybody has the personality to deal with, <laughs> with that sort of stuff. So it's not for everybody, but if you are interested in learning to see if it is, decarlytrading.com it's spelled d-e-c-a-r-l-e-y trading.com uh, free videos free articles all kinds of fun stuff if you're on social media twitter uh, at carly garner is the handle or you can just search carly garner in any of the social media feeds and find me yep and there'll be links to everything in the show notes so Perfect. you can just click on all of that carly's was an absolute pleasure thank you very much thanks for having me it was fun and i i'm going to take you up on that australia trip oh, I'm i'll do it. it when the board is open i'm going you better you better we have <laughs> right. to actually have a meal at some point yes in person. <laughs> i know this this is crazy yeah totally i feel crazy. like i a couple of years ago you and i got introduced and i feel like it is like i've got a friend that i've never met in person yeah but, but, but well we're change yeah it. yeah we are going to change all these that. places right. that I want to take. Like, I reckon you'd love Bondi Beach. I think that you'd love so many different parts of Sydney okay. and across Australia. So let's make it happen. Get the borders open. All right. <laughs> Peace, love, and peanut butter, everyone. Have an amazing rest of your day.